And, and now all that change in the identity in his life came because he met Jesus. And so he writes this letter to a group of people who are in the midst of experiencing change themselves. I mean, some of them are coming from a Jewish background, becoming followers of Jesus. They're coming from different family traditions. They're coming from different faith traditions. They're coming from different value sets, coming from different cults and religions that worshiped all kinds of different gods, all wondering the same thing. What, what does it mean to be me now? What, what is the you that makes you you? And so Paul spends the first three chapters of this letter saying, listen, this is who you are. 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 Don't miss this. You are a child of God. Not because of how awesome you are. And despite how terrible we can sometimes be, you are a child of God by grace. And then in chapter four, he makes this shift in the letter and he starts talking about what that means for your life. What does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to be a part of the family of the forgiven with the hope of a future, someday that'll be better than this day? What, what does it mean to be a part of that family when it comes to, to living out your relationships in the church, people who share your beliefs? What does, it come, what does it mean for when it comes to people living in a relationship with people who don't share your beliefs? What does it mean when it comes to living in a uh, relationship with the people that you work with, the manners and the motives that you bring to work? That's what we talked about last week. What does it mean uh, in your family, in relationship to, to your spouse or to your kids, kids to your parents? What is the you that makes you you and how does that impact how you live? And today, we're going to wrap it up. So, chapter 6, starting at verse 10. This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, finally, that's how you know we're at the end. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The Greek word behind that word schemes is the word methodes. It means methods. You can, you can take your stand against the devil's methods. We're going to talk about that. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If you have a hard time uh, buying into or believing in the idea of a spiritual realm, st stick with me. Just stick with me through this. Don't, don't check out. Therefore, Paul says, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you can be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that when I speak, words may be given to me, so that I could fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. And in case you forgot that this is like an actual letter written to people, he says, by the way, Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you can know how I'm doing and what I'm doing. I'm sending him for you to, this, to you for this purpose, that you may know how we are and that he can encourage you. And here's the sign off. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth, we pray together that the meditation of all of our hearts on this, your scripture reading, Lord, that it would be honoring to you and beneficial to our lives. Father, I pray that you would sink the gospel tr deep within us this morning. I plead with you that you, would, that you would ignite faith within us, that you would confirm faith within us and that we'd, we would walk out of here knowing a better sense of your love and your grace for us, your children. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of weeks ago, I, I brought up a guy named Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee was a, a Chinese pastor of an underground church and a missionary. He, he knew what it was like to experience opposition and hardship in his life, uh, not just because of his Christian faith. 
Mr. Nee says that the truth about Christian maturity and progress when you talk about growing as a Christian, it, it goes like this. He says you, you need to learn to sit, and then you need to learn to walk, and then you need to learn to stand. Sit, walk, stand. Now, if you're a parent, you're probably thinking to yourself, actually, Corey, that's backwards. First, you need to learn to sit, then you need to learn to stand, and then you need to learn to walk. What in the world is Watchman talking about? Well, he pulls that progression right out of this letter that we have now completed. If you've never read a book in the Bible, by the way, and you've been here the last 10 weeks, congratulations, you read a whole one. Uh, We've read that for the last 10 weeks, and the progression throughout this letter has been sit, walk, stand. Learn to sit in your identity in Christ. Learn to sit with the truth that, that God has spoken over you, which is that you are a forgiven child by grace, welcomed into the family of God, and promised a future, not because of anything you've done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. And once you've learned to sit in that, Mr. Nee says that you should learn to walk then in light of that. Since you've experienced the love of God, that ought to shape how you live your life. It should shape how you live your life with family, at work, at church, and with those who don't believe what you believe. And then he says, once you've learned to sit and walk, you need to learn how to stand. Now, when he says stand, he doesn't mean like stand. He means like that you need to learn to stand Stand up, stand firm, stand on solid ground. You need to learn to stand, which, which kind of raises the question for me, and I, I would imagine raises the question for you. What are you standing against? What are you standing up to? What is it that, that Mr. Nee thinks that we have to stand firm for? The Apostle Paul uses the same language. He says in the beginning of our passage that you need to be strengthened to stand. So, here's where we're going this morning. This is the, not just the message of, the title of the message, but this is also the message itself, okay? So if you're taking notes, to see some of you like to take notes, here's the message, right? The battle is way bigger than you could ever fathom, but the armor is far better than you could ever imagine. The battle is far bigger than you could ever fathom, and the armor is far better than you could ever imagine. Uh, We're going to be talking about three things. So for you note takers and for those of you who are wondering, is he almost done? Um, Here we go. Ready? We're going to talk about the armor, uh, sorry, the enemy, the armor, and the invitation, okay? We're going to talk about the enemy, the armor, and the invitation, We'll start with the enemy. Paul outlines at the very beginning, the reason you need to stand in life, what you need to stand against, is what you need to stand firm for, is because our battle is not against flesh and blood, he says. It's against a spiritual enemy. And then he outlines very simply, and what I imagine would be crystal clear to a first century person, he imagines, uh, he outlines really three phrases that describe the spiritual enemy that I think would be clear to them, but might be a little fuzzy for us. He says that, that the spiritual enemy is the rulers and authorities, the current uh, world powers of this darkness. I know in your translation, your Bible, it says the, the powers of this dark world. That's, I mean, that's a little bit unhelpful as to what he's actually saying. It's the world powers of this darkness. And then the last one is the, um, the, the evil spiritual forces in the heavenlies. Now that last phrase just refers to, is just a broad phrase that refers to the general existence of, of evil forces that we can't see in our lives. The, the first phrase of rulers and authorities refers to actual demons that Paul believes is, are oppressing people, tempting people, and, and leading people into sin. And that middle phrase is kind of an interesting one. The, the current world rulers of this darkness. It's actually a reference to the Greek gods that the people in Ephesus were already worshiping. It's a reference to to gods like like Zeus or like Artemis or like Isis. And and the reason Paul refers to them as, as the world powers of this darkness is because Paul believes that there's only one God. 
There's not a pantheon of gods. He believes that there's only one God, the, the Father, the creator of heaven and earth. And, and interestingly enough, that all the other gods of the pantheon, when you're, talking about, uh, when you're talking about Zeus, or you're talking about Artemis, or you're talking about Isis, all these other gods in the pantheon, Paul says those aren't real gods that rival, that rival Yahweh. That's not the case. It, those are all demons masquerading as gods, leading people away from the worship of the one true God. Which, if you're a um, Western, modern-minded person, you probably find that uh, not only distant from your own personal experience, but maybe not just far off from your everyday, but a little bit far-fetched. Can we admit that? Can, can we admit that like, our modern mindset does, doesn't lead us to in the direction, especially in the Western world. It doesn't lead us in the direction of, of thinking about evil spiritual realities that exist and, and influence and oppress people and lead them to sin. I mean, that seems a little bit, uh, I don't know, ancient, a little bit archaic, a little bit of an old way of, of thinking. And, and I want to start out this morning just by saying, I get that. If that's where you're at, I want you to know, like, I, I get that. That, that it's hard to think about that evil reality. Oh, that's nice. Thanks, Zach. Like, you never realize how loud that thing is until you shut it off. Um, that we, we don't really often think about evil that way. We, we'd much rather sort of shed the whole supernatural idea and causes for things and go looking for natural causes for things, right? That, that the reason evil things happen in the world, the reason people commit crimes, it's not because some demon led them to do it. It's because of the sociological and psychological factors that were involved in that person's life. You got to look at the family they grew up in, the neighborhood they grew up in, the government that was in charge at the time. The, that's just the social system that they were a part of that, that they, that sort of produced them who committed the crime that they committed. We, we don't, really like to say that things are evil anymore. We'd rather talk about things being dysfunctional or, or inappropriate behavior for a particular situation. And so we, you know, we'll distance ourselves from the idea. We know things are wrong. You know, racism is wrong, but, but, but we're not going to act like racism is like a spiritual evil that exists. I mean, it's just the result of an uneducated and, and intellectually unsophisticated way of viewing other people in the world who aren't like you. So I get that. But, but there are just three reasons why I, I, I'll tell you my reasons, three, three reasons why I can't just write off the, the existence of spiritual reality. I'm not going to put that on you, but I want you, you just decide for yourself. You decide for yourself what you think. I also re want to remind you, when it comes to following Jesus, first answer the Jesus question, then worry about spiritual reality later. But, but here's, here's the thing. I think, number one, I, I, I can't get rid of the idea of spiritual reality because of history. I think it's hard to look at history and go, there is no supernatural reality causing evil in the world. It's just the result of uneducated and intellectually unsophisticated people making terrible decisions because of psychological and sociological factors. That's a complicated sentence, I know. It's too long. Don't write that down. Here's the thing. One of the most heinous crimes committed by one of the most racist regimes in history, in recent history, was born out of one of the most intellectually sophisticated and educated countries on the planet. Germany is like the seat of en the enlightenment and education. And yet the Holocaust came out of there. To, to say that there's no supernatural evil that drives some of the evil atrocities we see in history, I, I think it's, it, just, it just doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me historically. The second reason um, I have a hard time with is, is culturally. Over two-thirds of the world's population believes in a spiritual reality and has wisdom to offer on how to handle and interact with an evil spiritual reality. It feels a little bit, just for me, it feels a little bit culturally arrogant for me to say, those, the rest of the world has nothing to offer to me on how to handle the spiritual world. So I can't, I can't so quickly write it off. But, but lastly, the reason I can't so quickly write it off is personal experience. 
I think when, when we read this battle's not against flesh and blood, but it's against a spiritual enemy, I think one of the things that we do is, is we get this picture in our head like, the, our battle is against a spiritual enemy. Everybody pick up your broom or put your backpack vacuum on and let's go hunt some ghosts. Like, that's how we think about a, a spiritual warfare. And, and the truth is, that's, that's not what Paul's shooting for at all. In, in fact, I think Paul would say, no, no, it's not there's no flesh and blood involved in this battle. It's that it's not flesh and blood alone. That, that the spiritual evil that exists manifests itself in, in flesh and blood ways that, that you see, and you know this intuitively for yourself, right? I know for myself, when it comes to, to well, it's, it's that force in my life that's outside me, but it's also inside me that, that makes it difficult for me to be generous, that makes it difficult for me to be gentle, to restrain my strength for the sake of someone else. It makes it difficult for me to be humble, to put somebody else in the spotlight of my life rather than always making myself the star of the show. It makes it difficult for me to be patient, whether in traffic or, or with a friend or with a child who's just driving me up the wall. Like there's something inside of me yet outside of me that is influencing my behavior that I, I fight against. It's, this, it's like a selfishness. The Bible talks about it as sin, this, this leading that causes us to be selfish, to, to focus and be preoccupied with me all the time. And I don't think I'm the only one. You see, the unseen spiritual evil manifests itself in all kinds of flesh and blood ways. I think if you got down to the bottom of racism, poverty, greed, or warfare, I think at the very base of it, you're going to find the selfishness of human beings. I think you're going to find that, that thing that's really difficult to explain with, with sociological or psychological factors that says, I'm I'm broken and selfish, and I, I do things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I do want to do. So Paul says, listen, that's the enemy that we're all going to be at war with. It's, it's outside of you, but it manifests itself in you all of the time. It's a spiritual enemy. And so you got to suit up to fight this thing. So number one, the enemy. Number two, the armor. Paul says, if you're going to fight this spiritual enemy that we are all at war with, you're going to need the full armor of God. So there are six. We're going to talk about four, and then we're going to talk about the last two together. Sound good? First four, and then the last two together. The first one. The first one is to buckle the belt of truth around your waist. Why would you need to buckle the belt of truth around your waist? Because the methodes of the devil... The number one method of the devil is to lie. Of that spiritual enemy that we all oppose is to lie. And the lie has not really changed since the beginning of history. In fact, the lie has been the same. It's been the same since Adam and Eve. The ancient writer of the story of Genesis tells us this story about Satan entering the garden as a snake and, and tempting Eve to take fruit, Eve, the mother of all living. And sometimes we get hung up going, yeah, but did that really happen? And, and really, the, I think if you ask the writer of Genesis, did that really happen? He'd be like, ah, eh, that's not really the point. The point is for you to ask yourself, doesn't that happen every single day? Here's the lie. It's repeated throughout scripture. It's repeated throughout the pages of history. And if I'm honest, it's repeated in my life over and over and over again. And I'm sure in yours. This is the lie. God's holding out on you. God is withholding from you. God could give, but he chooses not to. God, God is withholding from you what you need to flourish. You would be happier you would be healthier, you'd be wiser, and you'd be wealthier. You would be far better off if you lived outside of God's instructions for how to live life as a human being, and if you just decided for yourself what is right, if you just decided for yourself what's best, if you just decided for yourself what is flourishing. God's holding out on you. Here's how you know that this lie is at work in your life. You ever thought to yourself, has anybody ever said to you, you know, if God really loved you, if he really was there, he'd fix that. If God really loved you, if he was there, he'd change her. If God really cared about you, he'd bring him back. If God really loved you, he would 
then you fill in the blank. God's holding out on you. That's the lie. God is holding out on you. So Paul says, no, you need to buckle. You need to be wrapped up in the truth. And here's the truth. That God didn't withhold anything from you. In fact, God loved you so much that he put on flesh. He came and dwelled among us. He walked among us so that we could see what it looks like to be human, to flourish as a human being. And then he gave his life for you. God didn't withhold anything from you. He gave everything for you. So when the devil starts speaking those lies in your life, either through your own thoughts or through what you receive from the outside, you need to stand firm. Have be wrapped up in that truth that you, you know that God loves you. You know that God cares for you, not based on your current circumstance, but on the cross, that he was willing to give his only son for you. Belt of truth. Number two, breastplate of righteousness. The second method of the devil is to accuse. In fact, does anybody know what the Greek word for devil is? Same as the Spanish-ish. Anybody? Come on, who's in the first service? Diablo. Diablo. There you go. Diablos. Diablos. Uh, the Greek word for devil literally means to accuse. To accuse. The second method of the devil is, is to accuse your status with God. To tell you that, that you're not good with him. That you've gone too far. That you've run too far in the other direction from him. That you have become too unlovable. That you are unworthy. That you're too, too dirty and he can't clean you up. That you are beyond saving. That your relationship with God is permanently destroyed. And there is no going back. There is no turning around. There is no coming home. You might as well just keep running. You might as well just give yourself into a life of sin. You might as well just give in because God won't have you anyway. To accuse your status of your relationship with God. And so Paul says you got to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Your righteousness doesn't come from you. A Christian believes that the righteousness they have, in other words, the right relationship that they have with God comes from Jesus. It comes from what he did. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see your past. He doesn't see your failures. He doesn't see your mistakes. He doesn't see your regrets. He doesn't see all of your screw-ups in life. He sees Jesus. You see, when God looked at you, he wasn't disgusted by your sin and then holding you at arm's length. He was heartbroken, so he put on flesh to come so that you could know him in Jesus. So put on the breastplate of righteousness. So that when the arrows of the devil start coming, when the arrows of the devil start flying, when he starts sending those methods your way to accuse you, to say you're not worth it, you're not significant enough, you don't have enough value, you can say, I, I know where I stand with God. When it comes to me and God, I'm good. And not because I'm good, but because Jesus is good. And I have his righteousness in my place. Breastplate of righteousness, number two. Number three. Uh, it's a really kind of odd phrase, the readiness of the gospel that comes from the gospel of peace. It's a weird phrase. Actually, in the Greek, it has to do with your shoes. It has to do with what you wear on your feet. In other words, Paul says, you've got to take the gospel with you everywhere your feet go. Everywhere. You take the good news of the gospel of peace, that peace with God that you have because of Jesus, you take that wherever you go. Method number three of the devil, I think. Confusing the message with the messengers. Confusing the message with the messengers. I think if you typed in to Google, I don't know this, you can try it later if you want, but um, if you typed into Google, Christians are, you know what pops up? Christians are judgmental. Christians are hypocritical. Christians are anti-homosexual. Christians are anti-abortion. Christians are, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Number one method of the devil is to confuse the message with the messengers. The message of Christianity, the message of the gospel, is not bigotry. It's not obligation. It's not obedience. It's not regulations. It's not rules. It's not religion. Here's the message of the gospel. If you're taking notes, you got a pen out. One line. Christianity is God's mission to fix everything. 
starting with his relationship with you. That's it. Christianity is God's mission to fix everything, starting with his relationship with you. You see, I think the whole world knows what's wrong with people. We all agree what's wrong with us. Every major world religion, every major philosophy, even if you're a secularist or an atheist, we, we all know what's wrong with us, that we're profoundly selfish people. And our selfishness breaks our relationships with one another. Our selfishness breaks our relationship with the dirt that we live on. Think about all the problems we have in creation due directly to humanity's selfishness. And our selfishness even messes up our relationship to ourself. It skews our, our, our picture of us, our reflection, our, our own image. I mean, either we think way too highly of ourselves or we think way too low of ourselves. We have a skewed picture of who we are because honestly, we're just way too preoccupied with ourselves. And all of that brokenness and selfishness breaks our relationship with God too. But here's the thing. Every major religion, philosophy, life coaching you can receive is going to tell you the same thing. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. Here's how you fix it. You follow the eightfold path. Here's how you fix it. You live according to these rules in the system of karma so that you can be reincarnated to eventually exit this, the system, the cycle of reincarnation and enter and be one with the Atman or one with Nirvana, whichever you know, flavor of religion you choose. Every religion says the same thing. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do to fix you. And Christianity says something different. Christianity says, here's what God did to fix it. Here's what God did to fix it. He sent his son to fix his relationship with you. And following his son is going to begin to bring restoration in your relationships and restoration in how you see yourself and restoration in your relationship to creation. Not fully now. It's not going to happen fully in this life. It won't. But the end of our story is that God comes back and fixes this place. This is so, so important. The last chapter of this book, the end of this story is not one glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. That's not our story. Our story says when this life is over, someday God comes back and fixes everything. Everything that you look at in your life and you say, that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's broken and messed up. That's not the way it's supposed to be. God comes back and fixes it. He makes it all new. Everything made right. That's our story. That's what we believe. That's the gospel. God on a mission to fix everything, starting with his relationship with you. Don't confuse the message with broken, sinful messengers. Number four, faith. The faith. Take up the shield of faith, Paul says. You know, the gospel is the content of our faith, that gospel message that we just, I just outlined. That's, that's our faith. That would have been so important to the Ephesians that the Apostle Paul is talking to. And the reason was because for them, their identity, the, the you that makes you you, is that you practice these set list of religions, rules, regulations, habits, sacrifices, and all the rest, so that you can get the gods to do for you what you think the gods should do for you. The you that makes you you for them was that you get the gods to do for you what you... Th that's, that's what faith is. And Paul says, no, that's not faith in God. They believe that, that if I just sacrifice enough, if I just give enough, if I just pray enough, if I just write the, if I light the right amount of candles and then I, I say the right amount of words in the right rhythm with enough breaths and enough mmms and then the lights and the smoke and if I can just get it all right, then I can get the gods to do for me what I think the gods should do. For me, then I can get the gods to bless me. I can get the gods to give me success. I can get the God to love me. By the way, that should sound like an old form of Christianity that perhaps you grew up in. That if you just, if you just pray the right way, if you just show up to church the right amount of times, that if you, if you just lived a sinless life, if you just gave enough money, if you just treated people, if you just, 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 then God will. And Paul says, that's not faith in you. That, that's not faith in God. That, that's faith in you. That's faith in you. And so he says, when the devil 
tries, to, tries to, to come at you, to throw those arrows at you, to say, listen, you need to do better. You need to do more. You need to pray better. You need to give more. You need to live a better life. Otherwise, God's not going to love you. You can say, bring it on, devil. I got the shield. My faith isn't in me. It's not in my ability. It's not in my philosophy. It's not in my morality. It's not in any of those things. My faith is in Jesus, in his life for me, not me. And so I'm going to mess up and I'm going to make mistakes. But I trust in somebody who can actually fix it. Take that shield. (coughs) Last one. The last two together. Take the helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. A couple of language things. Number one. When Paul says the word take. uh, It doesn't mean like. You gotta take the helmet and run. It, It means receive actually. It's the Greek word dexomai. It means to receive. So I want you to hear what Paul is saying here. This is how adamant he is that you would receive this gospel, that you would receive this identity, that you would receive this faith, is that he says, take it. Please take it. Please take the salvation that's being offered to you. Please receive it. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which I know for us church people, we're like, the word of God, is that's the Bible. And, and it is. But that's not what Paul is exactly referring to here. Paul is referring to the words that God spoke of you. He's referring back to the very beginning of his letter when he said, receive those words that God spoke to you, that you are adopted into the family, that you are completely forgiven of every past mistake and regret, that you have been made completely clean and that you have the hope of a future. You are in the family of the forgiven with the hope of a future. Take that. Please receive that. Not as something that you had to earn or you had to discover, but as something that is given to you as a gift. So, the enemy, the armor, the invitation. What is the you that makes you, you? What is the you that makes you, you, even when everything changes around you, especially when everything falls apart? What is that core? You see, our common cultural narrative today, remember back from week one, was that, that the you that makes you, you, is the sum of your deepest desires and dreams. That, that if you could just discover that within yourself, that's where you can find the core of who you are. Your deepest desires and dreams make up who you are. But here's the problem. Your deepest desires and dreams, number one, well, they change over time. The things you wanted as a 12-year-old are not the things you want now. They are in conflict with each other. They're at war with each other sometimes. And, and third, they're actually far more culturally conditioned from the outside than you may like to admit or that I would like to admit. So you can also go looking for your identity outside of yourself. You can, the you that makes you you, perhaps you can try to find it in a community of people that you can live to please and gain their applause. You can try to find the you that makes you you in, in your work, in your job. You can find the you, you can try to find the you that makes you you in, in religion in a set list of practices or behaviors. But, but here's the truth. If you go looking for you in a group of people, you're never going to be enough for them and their applause is never going to be enough to sustain you for the rest of your life. If you go looking for it in a career, like we said last week, there's always going to be another rung to climb. There's always going to be another promotion to get. And at the end of the day, your career is never going to die for you but it might kill you and it might kill the people you love. And lastly, if you go looking for the you that makes you you in, in religion, in a set list of practices and behaviors that you engage in so that you can get the gods to do for you what you think the gods should do, that Paul says that's going to be a treadmill and you're not actually going to get anywhere. You're just going to get tired. So this morning, the invitation is simple. Would you receive the salvation. 
Would you receive that identity? That you're a part of the forgiven family with the hope of a future, not because of how great or terrible you are, but because of how great Jesus is. I'll be totally honest with you, completely upfront and transparent. I have taught through this series for the last 10 weeks for this question, for this moment. This is the part where maybe in other places you would start to play the music and so that I can get some kind of emotional response out of you and, and then we ask for hands up or heads down and, and those aren't bad things but I, I don't want that for you right now. What I want you to make a decision for yourself. I don't want you to worry about the people who are, who are around you. Uh, Zach, do you mind to hand these out? I want to invite you to, to decide for yourself. For some of you, decide for the first time. Decide for the first time to just receive that, that identity. That you're part of the family of the forgiven with a hope of a future because of Jesus. To call yourself a child of God. For some of you, I, I'm going to invite you to receive this not for the first time, but maybe for the hundredth time, maybe for the thousandth time. I'm going to ask that you put your, everybody put your hands up. Just put your hand up in the air. We're going to test out your lap muscles. It's good. Put your hand up in the air. When you receive a card, you can go ahead and put your hand down. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to invite you to uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, three. I'm going to invite you to take a look at this card and consider... Consider identifying as a child of God today. And while you consider, we're going to sing a song together. And if this is you, you can go ahead and, and write your name on the line. But here's the thing. Don't do it for me. I, I want this for you, but, but don't do it for me. Decide for yourself that this is what, this is what you want, that you want to receive this. Decide for yourself. Don't, don't worry about the people that you're, you're sitting at a table with. That you're, what do you got? Is that good? How many more? You got folks back there? You guys got one? Here, can you just take those back there? You can actually take the rest of them. And go, oops. Go ahead and write your name on it and take a second to consider. And if it's not you this morning, and you're like, you know what, Corey, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm ready to say this is me. I don't think I'm ready to say this is my identity. Um, that's okay. That's okay. Just, you can take that card and you can just slide it in your pocket or you can leave it on the table. That's fine. But, but I wanted to give you an opportunity this morning to receive the identity that your Father in heaven, that Jesus, the one who gave his life for you, wants you to have by grace. So uh, would you pray with me? And then we're going to sing together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your grace in our lives. Lord, I, I pray that, that for each one of us this morning, that you would move in our hearts to receive what you have for us. Lord, I pray that at the same time, you would help us to learn to sit in that salvation, to learn to sit in our identity in you. Lord, I pray that you would put people in our lives who help us to walk in light of that identity. And thank you for giving it to us in such a way that it strengthens us to stand firm so that we can handle whatever life throws at us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.